I have been taught that, if you want to examine any subject in detail, it's always best to start with a definition. In the case of the cable toe, that's a bit difficult. The Oxford English Dictionary cites a number of special combinations with the word cable, for example, cable rope, cable stock, cable range, and several others. But it doesn't mention cable toe. In fact, the term is not known outside of Freemasonry. So what actually is a cable toe? The Ashley Encyclopedia of Knots describes a cable as three plane or hawser laid ropes laid up together left-handed. When you look at a piece of rope, the individual strands spiral to the right. This type of rope is called a hawser, and a cable is three of them twisted so that they spiral to the left. A rope like this is rarely less than 10 inches in circumference, and usually it is more. It's most often used for moving heavy objects, for example, a ship. From such uses, it became a towing rope, which became shortened colloquially to a tow. Moving the massive blocks used in the construction of ancient buildings and monuments would have called for ropes as big as a tow, and there can be no doubt that our ancient operative brethren were familiar with them. However, the rope which we know as a cable tow is not nearly as heavy. Further, the earliest allusion to a rope as a piece of equipment used in the preparation of a Masonic candidate is in a document dated about 1710, well within the speculative era. Even then, it was not described as a cable tow for another 50 years or so. All this suggests to me that the expression was introduced to Freemasonry's vocabulary by the speculative Masons as they gradually but steadily clothed the speculative science with the symbols and the terminology of the stonecutters. This is not to say that the speculatives invented the idea. On the contrary, the halter, in the preparation of initiates, and as a token of submission, as a history that goes back almost as far as records have been kept. A vase found in Chama, in Mexico, shows a group of candidates going through a ceremony not unlike a Masonic degree. One candidate is being taught a sign. The others all have halters with a running noose around their necks. On the other side of the ancient world, the Druids, the Greeks, and the Brahmins all put a halter around an initiate's neck in their religious ceremonies. In the Brahminical ceremonies, it was the emblem of Yama, the god of death. He used it to snare men's souls and drag them out of their bodies. Shiva, the second aspect of the Hindu trinity, carries it to symbolise his power to destroy human life. Thirty centuries ago, the votaries of Zoroaster believed that everyone has a noose around his neck. At death, it fell from the righteous, but dragged the wicked down to hell. Part of the preparation in the ancient mysteries of Egypt was placing a chain or rope around the candidate's neck. This was said to signify his belief in God's service. That he was also blindfolded, made of the halter a symbol that he was being led from darkness, the darkness of ignorance, to light, the light of knowledge of the one true and living God. Brother Bernard Shillman points out that it was customary among the ancient Semitic races for captives, bondmen and other menials to wear a halter as a token of submission to their masters. In 1 Kings chapter 20, verses 31 to 32, we read that after Ben-Hadad, king of Syria, was defeated by the army of Ahab, king of Israel, his servants came in, dressed in sackcloth and with ropes on their heads, to plead with Ahab for their master's life. Ahab spared Ben-Hadad because of their voluntary action and their pleas for mercy. This symbol of submission is so powerful that it lasted for more than 2,000 years, right up to medieval times. The Burgesses, the city council of Calais, dressed in their shirts with halters around their necks, presented the keys of the conquered city to Edward III, who, influenced by the pleading of his queen Philippa, spared their lives. On the 1st of May, 1517, known as Evil May Day, there was a riot in London. The ringleaders were arrested and tried in Parliament before King Henry VIII and his Chief Justice, Cardinal Wolseley. They appeared in their shirts with ropes about their necks and set up such a piteous cry for mercy 
but the king pronounced them pardoned. A diarist in the middle of the 17th century records that the city magistrates of Ghent in modern Belgium paraded annually to the statue of the Emperor Charles V in the marketplace with ropes about their necks as a token of submission and penance for an old rebellion. The halter's first appearance in Freemasonry is in a document known as the Dumfries No. 4 Manuscript, which dates to about 1710. The reference is in two questions in the Catechism. Question. How were you brought in? Answer. Shamefully, with a rope about my neck. Question. Why a rope about your neck? Answer. To hang me if I should betray my trust. We may note in passing that the penalty for improper disclosure at the dawn of the Grand Lodge era was quite different from ours. But, in terms of our subject of interest, if the fraternity could assume the right to hang a man for improper disclosure, if it were able to take a member's life, it could only do so then, as now, if the member gave that right. And so the cable toe still retained its symbolism as a token of submission. As far as I am aware, the cable toe is part of the preparation of every Freemason in the world, and in every ritual it carries a connotation of submission, of humility, and of servitude. In the first degree of the ancient York Rite, it is the means of removing from the lodge an initiate who, by refusing to conform to our customs and ceremonies, has rendered himself untouchable. In the Canadian Rite, however, it speaks of restraint, captivity, and even threatens life. This theme of restraint and danger is echoed in the rituals of the British Lodges. The rituals of the modern Lodges all show a practical use for the halter. To lead an untouchable failure out of the Lodge, or to restrain an impetuous candidate. To kill him even, if he resists. Even in the early ritual documents cited earlier, it was the practical means of carrying out the penalty of the obligation. However, None of these uses resemble the purpose of the item of builder's equipment which gave its name to the Freemasonry's halter. This very disparity should lead us to suspect that Freemasonry's cable toe has a symbolic rather than a practical meaning. That, and our own knowledge that the gentle craft excels as no other organisation in loading the most ordinary objects with esoteric meaning. I asked you earlier to note a point the number of times the cable toe was wrapped around a certain part of the body. In the fellow craft and Master Mason's examinations of the ancient York Rite, the answers to the cable toe questions are definitely symbolic. The cable toe and the number of times it is wrapped are said to indicate the increase in responsibility and concomitant with Masonic progress. In the British Lodges, the, pro the progression is reversed, beginning with the greatest number of turns and decreasing with each degree. The rationale for this is that, with Masonic progress, the mystic tie becomes stronger, and so the need for physical restraint becomes less. While we're in the higher degrees, it's here that the young Mason learns that the cable toe is more than a rope. At the same time, it's also a measurement. A measurement? Yes, exactly. To answer and obey, etc., if within the length of my cable toe. But what on earth is the length of a cable toe? This concept is a modern survival of one of the oldest operative regulations which obliged the stonecutters to attend the annual assemblies except when sick or in peril of death. No cable toe was mentioned then, of course, but from this requirement grew the expectation that every brother would attend his lodge if he was within three miles of the meeting place. Presumably, this was as far as he could be expected to walk, but the several copies of the old charges in existence differ wildly on this distance, and variations between 3 and 50 miles are not uncommon. Nowadays, it is accepted that this obligation is simply a promise to attend if within one's ability and no specific distance is involved. But, here is a meaning within a meaning. The length of my cable toe can be regarded as a symbol of the binding covenant I have made, and part of this covenant is in a pledge to assist others. In this respect, the length of my own cable toe 
depends on my ability and willingness to fulfill my obligations, and I must decide that length for myself. Measurement of service can never be subject to any externally imposed limitation, for who else can decide the length of my spiritual ties? How long is my cable tow? It's as long as I want it to be. All this notwithstanding, the cable tow makes its greatest impact on the mind of an initiate in the first degree, which we can regard as the degree of Masonic birth. And the idea of birth is appropriate to my last symbol, the most beautiful one I found in this study. In his Introduction to Freemasonry, Carl H. Claudy likens the cable tow to the life cord by which the embryo receives life from the mother. In the first degree, the cable tow is removed as soon as the obligation is assumed, i.e. Masonic birth, just as the physical cord is cut as soon as the baby is born. But, just as the knife was never made which can sever the spiritual bond between a man and his mother, neither is there any known power which can sever the spiritual bond between a brother and the gentle craft. When the umbilical cord is cut, it is replaced by the love and care of mother and family. In the same way, the cable toe is replaced by the mystic tie of brotherly love, the mystic tie which keeps masonry a house undivided, that mystic tie which bonds the craftsmen together. No power on earth can break that world-encircling bond of brotherhood.